It's not important when you step outside. It's important that you do step outside. My guest today made this insightful statement which left me thinking deeply. In today's episode, we will answer three key questions. What are the different frequencies of light and how do they affect us? What is the truth about ultraviolet light? How can infrared light help us? After struggling with fatigue and exhaustion for years, Bastian Groys decided that he had had enough of feeling tired and committed to being healthy, energetic and vital. That journey eventually led him to discover light and circadian rhythms. Years of research and personal exploration eventually led to the birthing of the circadian app which is the why and how of circadian rhythms. He is currently in the process of fully committing himself to the circadian app and being an ambassador for natural light and a circadian lifestyle in tune with nature. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm Deepa, Light Functional Medicine Practitioner, author and yogini and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast, I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Bastian, welcome back to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. We had a great conversation earlier and um, I know that your app has really improved a lot since our last conversation and people can scroll down the show notes and take a listen to our old conversation and also I would like us to talk a little bit more about the app itself today because I truly think that nothing else exists like this one. Um, and we will focus today more on light and how the different frequencies of light um, they do impact our circadian rhythm, our endocrine system, our sleep itself. So let's just dive into the conversation. And for somebody who really doesn't know, I'd love for you to break down what are the different frequencies of light itself, and then we can explore a little bit deeper into each of them. Sure. I think before we dive into the, the, the different wavelengths and frequencies, it's important to understand that I guess light is basically electromagnetic energy. And as any form of energy, um, when, it, um, when it meets an, a, an organic tissue, um, it has an effect. Because people often think that, oh, what, what could light possibly do or what, what effect could light possibly have on our body um, and yeah if we think more about from the terms of it's an energy and that energy will trigger certain reactions in the body and it obviously does that in plants right so it's quite obvious without photosynthesis which basically converts the light and oxygen into carbon um, and creates sugar uh, creates carbon um, there will be no life, life on the planet and the same happens not the same, but in a similar tone, it happens in us. So that's one, one important aspect to understand about light, that it is electromagnetic energy. The other aspect is that light um, is or has different wavelengths. And we all know the colors of the rainbow. That's one part of the, of the light spectrum, basically going from violet to, um, to red light. And there's also the parts of the of the light spectrum that are um, before the blue spectrum, or so the invisible spectrum, which is the ultraviolet spectrum, which is broken down in three parts. 
and then on the other end, past the red spectrum or past the red wavelengths, there's the infrared. And infrared is also broken down into three, um, three areas. And so wavelengths basically means it's kind of a, a, a wave-like wave -like kind of motion. And the, the um, shorter wavelengths um, is, is the ultraviolet and the blue, and then the medium wavelengths is more the kind of the green and the yellows. And the longer wavelengths is then the red and the infrared. That's important to understand and appreciate because these different wavelengths penetrate into the body to different depths. So for example, ultraviolet, ultraviolet um, only really hits the surface of the skin and just, just, below, just below the surface versus infrared can penetrate deep into the tissues can penetrate multiple kinds of centimeters. So, and there's a, it's a simple experiment people can do at home because most people have a remote for the television or for the stereo or for something else, right? And what happens um, because the, the remotes normally work on infrared um, and you could, you could trial that if you hold up your hand and put the remote on one end and aim it at your television, let's say, um, the remote usually will still work because the infrared wavelength is on such a long wavelength, so it goes through, mostly through the tissue and out the other end. So that just shows in a really simple way that different wavelengths penetrate deeper. Um, and that's also happening um, in the atmosphere. Like the short wavelengths is actually with ultraviolet B, for example, there's only less than 1% of the entire ultraviolet um, B radiation that hits uh, the planet. Um, is only is actually reaching the surface. Everything else is filtered out by the atmosphere. So it's just important to understand these um, the penetration depth of these wavelengths because it has a. So that's a rough overview of of the I guess the physical properties of light, and looking at what sunlight is composed of. And what's also important to understand is that about 50% of sunlight is red and infrared light. So half of the light spectrum we evolved under is red and infrared light. So that must have a um, specific importance. Otherwise, Mother Nature would not, would not have designed our bodies to interact with that frequency um, and give it such a... Uh, I guess, a, a significance with regards to the, uh, the proportion that it is available in. And the, the, let's take a step back. So that's the overview of light. And then we have the timing of sunlight. Sunlight, sunlight always shifts, it's always dynamic. It never is, it never is uh, the same. It changes throughout the day and it changes throughout the seasons. And within that change is actually timing information that um, our body can decipher and can, can tell the time of day if we're exposed to the natural kind of daylight. If um, we don't get these light cues and these timing cues, um, then there is a problem because our circadian rhythm, which ideally is synchronized to our environment, um, needs to be needs to be matched. If that's not matched, it can can think of almost like an like a like an airport, where you know plants need to um, depart and arrive at certain times, and every, everything is kind of tightly synchronized. If that's not happening, then there's chaos, and then there's accidents, and then things go away. The same is happening in our bodies. If we don't, um, if the, all the entire biochemical processes that need to happen in each cell every second are not coordinated, then we also have chaos and chaos in, on a cellular level basically is a synonym for inflammation. So that's just a rough kind of overview of, uh, of light and, and, and circadian rhythms.
And that's a great view, Bastian. And I know in our last conversation, we also went a little bit into these differing circadian rhythms. And I feel it's really important for the few of us who do believe we need to be in sync with nature's diurnal rhythm to just bring attention to that every now and then, because there's a lot of information out there today on um, how we can biohack nature, how we can be the night owl and how we can function at our very best in the middle of the night. So I'd love for you to take a very short segue into that and just talk about, you know, you did mention being in sync. So um, has this view of yours changed given how much uh, popularity these different sleep chronotypes are getting in today's world? No, not at all, really. Um, if if one thing that that becomes more important to me as time goes by is is kind of I guess overall rhythmicity, so that we even let's say because some people cannot um, due to their work circumstances and 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 social circumstances they simply cannot get up with the sun and have that rhythm and they're bound by by another rhythm for better or worse. But what's most important, and that's true even for shift workers, I actually just, um, we put together a guide for, um, for shift workers and circadian rhythms and how to best mitigate the risk of, of shift work. And interestingly enough, it's pretty much, you, you ought to do the same things that you ought to do for your ideal circadian day, right? And what, what does that mean? That basically means um, you need bright light in the morning. You want to eat when you rise. You want to be physically active when you rise because these are kind of three, three main circadian clues, cues. Light is um, the main cue, which sets the master clock in the brain. And then we have peripheral clocks, clocks in, the, in the gut and then our uh, digestive tract, um, which are set by when we eat. And then we have um, peripheral clocks in our muscles that are that are cued in and that are set when we move and when we're physically active. So no matter when you start your day, that's what you want to do. You want natural light in your eyes if possible. You want to move. And then let's say between an hour to three hours of waking, you want to ingest food and kickstart the, your uh, metabolism and also kickstart the, the clocks in your digestive tract. Right. So that's a that's a rough kind of rundown on circadian rhythmicity. So no matter where you are in the day, no matter where you start your day, and I know it's not sexy because people don't want to hear that, but basically <laughs> you want to wake up at the same time every day and you want to go to bed at the same time every day. And that's the most simple, the most powerful thing you can do for your health, for, for sleep, for circadian rhythmicity. Um, and make it easier for your body to predict and to be ready to do the things you need to do. If your body can anticipate yeah, what's happening when, then the digestive juices can be ready when you are, because, oh, okay, it's 10 o'clock, we are eating now. If we're eating every day, then the body is ready, it's get up, all the enzymes are there, all the digestive juices are there, and then everything can run um, smoothly. If that's not the case, if that's constantly changed, then the body is just not able to anticipate what's happening when and then other processes have been started and then they that interferes with what actually needs to happen so that's that's a general kind of overview um but it's tricky for most people to to stick to a rhythm and then live that rhythm that would make it much easier no matter no matter what you do but obviously the social pressures and and um yeah people are under often interfere with that yeah, absolutely. And we did a whole conversation on what you described in episode number 140 on how if somebody has shift work, uh, they need to build their rhythms to suit their uh, work schedule, even if it's flipped over. But let's come back to our conversation at hand. And you mentioned these different light frequencies. I'd love for you to dive into each of them in terms of how do they uh, affect us. I know your experiment with the remote was really beautiful because it's great to even describe to a child about these different frequencies. I'd love for us to go through them 
uh, in terms of how are they impacting us? How do they impact hormones? And you know, we hear a lot about ultraviolet, and then there's of course the whole controversy of sunscreen. So I'd love to talk about all sure. of that. Yeah. Um, so what's what's important to understand is that we have these hormonal kind of rhythms in our body. The you could call it I like the term ebb and tide, hormonal ebbs and tides, because it refers to the receding and the and the coming in of the ocean. And that's really what's happening in our bodies. And the a couple of the key hormones are cortisol and melatonin. And they are directly and indirectly um, linked to light, um, indirectly through circadian rhythms and directly through the light itself. And in a, in a healthy distribution, cortisol kind of peaks when we wake up. And the, the more significant that peak is, um, the better the kind of the day starts. What's, 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 what's difficult is if that, if that peak is delayed or if we have a constantly elevated level of cortisol, that leads to problems. Same as if we have a, a still high melatonin levels in the morning, that will make us feel really groggy and really under the weather. We won't feel like we can get going. And we, yeah, just because they, they work antagonistic. But in order them for, for to have that, um, that difference and these different kind of peaks and troughs, light is important and what light we're exposed to when. So what happens when we wake up? The best thing for, for us to, to actually wake up and be alert and, and set our rhythm is to step outside so that we can receive the blue light because blue light is absorbed mainly by the melanopsin cells in the eye, which are linked to the suprachiasmatic nucleus in the brain, which is our master clock. And so these cells, are uh, their peak absorption is in, in the blue light spectrum at around 460 nanometers. Unfortunately, so that's one aspect, that's, uh, that's the circadian rhythm aspect. So that means I'll, I'll jump back and forth a bit as we go on between circadian rhythms and between hormones. Yeah, because there is a difference. They are, they are, they are linked and they're interdependent, but how they're triggered um, is, a bit, um, is a bit different. So whenever we receive that blue light, we basically get a timing information to the brain and that sets the circadian rhythm. If we get that information at the wrong time, then we get the wrong timing signal. So and keep in mind that the solar spectrum is constantly shifting. So the proportion in which there's ultraviolet, blue, all the other colors, red and infrared, is constantly in flux. Yeah, so in that, that uh, distribution and that change in the, in the spectrum as a whole gives us timing information. So at, at sunrise, there's predominantly red, a little bit of blue, and no UV. So, but it's, and then the other aspect of light, which we haven't mentioned, is, is the brightness or the illumination. The problem is, you can be inside, you can turn your lights on, you still, um, to, to a certain degree, not as pronounced, but you still set the circadian clocks in your, in your, um, in your hypothalamus region and the SCN in the brain. But from your indoor lighting, because it's not bright enough, you don't get the peak in cortisol. You don't get the rise in cortisol. In order for you to get to really experience that lift and that, that wake up response, you need to go outside. There's no way around it. Yeah, because then A, a you, you, you spike your cortisol and B, you tank your melatonin. And that's exactly what needs to happen. So it's really important to step outside in the morning and get that blue light. You, it's not enough to just do it at inside. So if we, if we just stick with blue light and jump to the end of the day or we jump to the night, 
that's when we definitely don't want blue light. Because and we, again, we tell our we tell our brain that it's it's morning or it's midday, and that's obviously the wrong timing information and creates chaos. But also, again, it elevates cortisol, and it it suppresses melatonin because melatonin is only released in the pineal gland in the absence of light. So, and then we elevate our cortisol at night, which we don't want because it's naturally falling. And we tank our melatonin at night, which is what we don't want because we want it to rise. So, and then we shift basically that entire hormonal um, flux between these two hormones and throw them off. And then no wonder we are a mess in the morning because melatonin will still be elevated. We don't get our cortisol up and we're kind of like, well, like down and can't perform and can't function well. Particularly if we shift bed and bed times and wake times, that's another spanner in the works if we do that. So that's kind of, I guess, a rough kind of rundown on the blue light. And then what happens next in the, in the morning at around, depends, half an hour to one and a half hours after sunrise, ultraviolet light appears in the sky. It appears later because it's a shorter wavelength and needs to travel through the atmosphere. And that only happens when the sun is a bit higher in the sky. So then it actually reaches the surface of the earth. And well, so what first appears is, um, is UVA, then UVB, and UVC actually is completely filtered out by the atmosphere. It never reaches, uh, it never reaches the surface of the Earth. So first up is UVA, and then after that, usually uh, an hour, two hours later, we have UVB. So at 10 degrees, um, UVA reaches us. Um, at 30 degrees, when the sun is 30 degrees in the sky, UVB reaches us. UVA is fundamentally important for um, actually lowering blood pressure, which is interesting because obviously, you know, heart disease and cardiovascular disease is, is the number one killer. And it's phenomenal for lowering kind of blood pressure. It does that through releasing nitric oxide that's under the skin. When UVA hits it, it releases it and it vas vasodilates and widens the arteries and then blood can flow easier and, and there's less pressure. So that's easier for the heart. But um, it's also interesting to note there's this, um, and that's actually a relatively recent um, discovery. There's a, an opsin called neuropsin, which is found in the eyes, it's found in the skin, and it's also found in the brain. And neuropsin has a peak absorption in the, um, in the UV range. So it's primed to absorb UV light. And it's interesting because what they, it's not clear, they're not quite sure the, the mechanism and, and how it functions, but the hypothesis is that it's another timing cue that we receive um, and that it's actually, because it's interesting because it's also in the brain and obviously UV light doesn't reach the brain, but we have um, also so-called biophotons which are released from cells at an ultra weak emission, um, which are releasing UV light. So that's the way this, this, neuro, this neuropsin in the brain um, might be functioning, who knows? Um, but the idea is that um, they believe it can actually time, it can tell time independent from the cadian rhythms. So it's another, it's almost like the way I look at it, it's like a, like a secondary timing, timing system based on UV light that might be um, like a secondary pathway, if um, um, like almost like a, not sure if it's a backup system, I don't know, but it seems like to be a secondary pathway. Um, and it's tied to, to ultraviolet light. But UV light, UVA, um, also releases a cascade of hormones, which is, which is very interesting, um, particularly endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, all the things that um, make us happy, make us feel good, make us um, like interested in things, make us want to explore things. We need, yeah, we need to 
see if the UV, the UV light to, um, to our skin, it's not enough to just receive that in the eyes. It's good in the eyes for, that, for timing information, but in order to make the hormones that make us feel good and make us feel energetic and, and pumped up, we need to actually receive it. Um, I'm going to stop skin. you for a second, Bastian, because the common word out there is just fear around ultraviolet light. So I'd love for you to talk about, I mean, obviously you're telling us that there's a reason that these frequencies are at specific times and what each of those does for us. So I'd love for you to also interweave this common fear around ultraviolet and of course blocking all of that with sunscreen because I see it all the time. Yeah, yeah, it's unfortunately very common. And um, the the unfortunate thing is that there isn't actually one clear study that shows that provided light, um, at least in the in the sunlight spectrum, when it's in the normal kind of packaging, so to speak. Um, actually causes skin cancer. There is there is no study. What they what they did, um, I think it was more in the in the seventies and eighties, where they um, used huge doses of ultraviolet light and uh, shown that on eyes and shown that on skin of of animals um, and people, and then of course um, it causes a decay. It causes photo damage. There's no no doubt about that. But A is completely out of context because you isolate one, one frequency and then you increase the dose. And it, yeah, it's, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense because um, blue light is also phototoxic. No one talks about that. Beautiful, Bastian. In fact, there's a saying in Eastern ancient tradition that in large amounts, even Amrit or the elixir of life is poison. And we've all come into this pattern of thinking that more is better. So which is why everything that we do, we find something and then we are putting it out into irrational levels and it really doesn't make any sense. Yeah, yeah. It's it's also that um, unfortunately it's our behavior that's that's a problem as well, right? Because if you look if you look to nature, um, animals are active around dawn and dusk, mostly. That's the primary time for activity. At noon, when the sun is highest and has the strongest energy output, nature kind of rests. Yeah, and we don't do that. We kind of live inside. We um, I'm not not sure to what degree we can we can look at the the we we actually need to do that the balancing of of ultraviolet and blue and red and infrared, which is kind of crucial to understand. But we we I pause that for the moment. But we live inside, and then we go out. So the skin is not adapted at all to cope with a high energy of light. And then we go out in the middle of the day for long periods of time. And of course we get burned. We, of course we get hammered. There's no, it's, it's no surprise. You're just not, it's, it's just not adapted. It's like you can't run a marathon if you haven't trained for it. It's just it's stupid. Yeah, but again, because the way we live and then people sleep in and then they have a long breakfast. And then by the time they're ready, yeah. They go out in the middle of the day and then they can't cope. And then, oh, I need to protect myself. Yes, you need to protect yourself. But um, what you really want to do is you want to go out early in the day when the energy of the light isn't that strong, when there's proportionally even more red and infrared than blue and UV or no UV. So your body can prepare for what's coming later and then also at the end of the day, you want to get exposure, your skin exposure to, to sunlight in the, in the late afternoon and early evening so that any damage that naturally occurs is repaired. It's not about not having damage. Damage is part and parcel of, of life. When, when we make energy in our mitochondria, damage is a byproduct. Reactive oxygen species is a byproduct. Um, it's more the question, do you accumulate more damage than you can repair? That's a real question. 
Yeah, so it's not about wavelengths are damaging because they are stressing, they're stimulating, they're activating. And part of that is there's a, a friction and there is, is, a, is a byproduct and that's, that's a problem. Um, and that needs, to be, that needs to be repaired. And interestingly, that's exactly what infrared and red light do, right? So that's really the interesting part because if you look at, let's just jump to the mitochondria because in the mitochondria, the, the electron transport chain, which makes ATP and makes cellular water in each of our cells is more efficient and under red light because red light um, structures the water around these organelles. It charges the water and the, the heat from the infrared, which is basically heat, is another way of thinking about it, actually um, brings the electron transport chain kind of closer together, like at a, at a microscopic level. We're talking, um, I think, the, uh, on the atomic scale, is, I think it's angstrom. It's a measure of, of uh, it's like a millions of a, of a millimeter or something like that. If the electron transport chain is closer together, the tunneling of the electrons along that chain is more efficient. If it's more efficient, um, A, we need less energy. And also, the, if the jump or if the distance between these chromophores is too, is too long or too far apart, what happens is there's more reactive oxygen species that are being produced because electrons get lost. And then they, they go seeking other atoms and molecules where they, can, where they can steal other elements from and then reactive oxygen species are created. So it's actually the lost electrons that are kind of part of that cascade of, um, of energy production. And if that's been made more efficient by infrared light, then we have less reactive oxygen species with more efficient energy production with less outfall. So that's a massive thing. And that's kind of the, the explanation why photobiomodulation or low level light therapy um, is so effective and can pretty much treat anything that we kind of know of because it supports the mitochondria and the mitochondria obviously in each, um, in each cell in our bodies, except the red blood cells. And that's why it, it can seem like bizarre when, you know, you can treat the skin, you can treat the hair, you can treat bone, you can treat uh, wound healing, you can, uh, you can treat inflammation, you can treat pretty much everything, eye health, <laughs> yeah? uh, oral health, um, gut health is all impacted by, by red and infrared light. And that's, that's kind of the, the reason why. And I want you to clarify, Bastian, because you did mention earlier that, you know, it's always more is not always better. And so given that, I mean, are you talking to us right now about using infrared light therapy as in how it's become popular or using it from nature? And is there a difference in that? Um, and uh, won't that increase the dose as we spoke about earlier? Yeah, so I guess uh, there is a place, um, there's definitely a place for, for uh, photobiomodulation or low level light therapy because you can target specific tissues. Yeah, you can, you can target tissue that are, that are damaged, that, that have problems and you can, you can almost like, yeah, give it more, give that tissue more energy and help it self heal and help it regenerate. Um, but it's not a replacement for stepping outside. It, it never will be. Um, it, doesn't, it doesn't make any sense. Uh, I just saw that the other day, uh, uh, there was an article where they appreciated that, oh, red light is really important for eye health, particularly as we age. And their solution was, um, or what they did in the study, they um, gave the study participants a red torch to hold it in front of their eye for, I can't remember the, the, the length, like I said, that's five minutes in the morning. 
and they saw uh, an increase in um, in the health of the, I think it was the rods and, and visual acuity in the eye. Yeah, but that's like looking at like, well, it's no surprise that, that it helps because in our modern lifestyle, red and infrared light, it's absent from modern lighting. It's not, it has been removed. And since most everyone lives 90% indoors, they pretty much don't get any red and infrared light. And therefore, any assessment based upon that nature is more because it's at that moment probably countered that severe deficiency. And that's not really indicating that it's something to be used forever. Yes, and it's it's almost like, um, well, the, the symptom has presented itself with a problem in a tissue, right? But the root cause is that you're not getting the signals and your hormones are off and the, the may, probably the energy production because most diseases, 80% of diseases is known now there are mitochondrial diseases based on mitochondrial dysfunction. So if you deprive your mitochondria of the very frequency that makes them work more efficient and reduces the reactive oxygen species and the damage that occurs, then you're shooting yourself in the foot. It's like, it, there's no way that you can mitigate that by treating specific, yes, you might treat that specific outfall or that specific symptom that you're, that you're having, but other symptoms will occur if you don't change your lifestyle. So it, it's really, because we are so removed and it's, it's really, I guess, interesting. And the, and the whole emphasis, right, that we hear is just all about taking this pill, taking that supplement, um, changing food here and there. But the, it's, it's evident now that you're not dependent on your genes. You're, the genes are the, um, how to put it, how genes are turned on and off is driven by your lifestyle and is driven by your environment. You might have some genes that are disadvantageous and put you at a certain risk, but whether they are expressed or not entirely depends, maybe not entirely, but hugely depends on the lifestyle choices you make. Yeah, and the gene expression um, is, is regulated like 50% of gene expression is under circadian rhythm control. 50%. Uh, another number is, I think 2000 genes are, are regulated by vitamin D. So it's just a couple of aspects that should like go, okay, boom. Um, this, is, this is majorly important. And you know, Bastian, when I was doing research for my book and I came across and wrote a section on the antagonistic relationship between vitamin D and melatonin, and of course, it makes perfect sense, right? Because vitamin D is so much in sync with sunlight. And uh, so what it showed was that vitamin D dosing can disrupt melatonin for about 12 hours. And there's so much recommendation everywhere, even in the health space where um, dosing for vitamin D is prescribed at dinner. And then they're wondering why people cannot sleep. And of course, the high dose as well. Uh, so it's so important that if we were meant to get vitamin D from the sunlight, and if we are relying on supplementation, it makes perfect sense that we must try to synchronize these practices with what would be evidently circadian flows uh, in the body with light and darkness. Um, and I know we don't have too much time, but I do want you to walk us through your app in terms of these spectrums of light. So I'd love for you to talk about, does the app show us when is there uh, each of these different frequencies? And also in terms of when you describe what each of them does in the body, does the app make recommendations just to let us know um, this is the best time to be doing something. What do we need to do? And I know I've been guilty of 
not regularly using app i get all the alerts and i've kind of just shut up but i'm going to start using it as of today because i'd love for you to walk us through how to actually make the best use of the app well, i think it's highly individual like um i probably the, the most because if you if you if you set your aim too high um you know we're going to fall motivation will lapse and then um, it's not going to happen. It might happen for a few days or a week or a couple of weeks at the most. And then it's usually something gets in the way and we kind of stop. So I guess the best way is to um, pick one thing. And then whether that's, you know, putting your blue blockers on at night or whether that's um, having regular light breaks and stepping outside um, at, at certain intervals during the day or um, finishing or setting an ET window, maybe compressing your eating window a bit. Um, whatever it is, I would pick one and then maybe instead of setting a notification, set an alarm. So your phone actually gets off and you need to turn the alarm off. Um, and then it's more likely that, um, that you might do that. But um, to your question, yes. Um, we basically show sunrise, solar, noon, sunset. We show nightfall uh, and daybreak. We show when UVA appears, UVA set and U UVA rise and UVA set and UVB rise and UVB set. Um, it's not so important, I guess, it's important when you step outside, but it's, it's, what's most important is that you step outside. Let's put it that way, if that makes sense. You can fine tune things later, but the more time you spend outside, even if it's just five minutes here and there, that's that's what you want to do. It's most important, without a shadow of a doubt, in the early morning when you wake up. If you can do that just for five minutes, you do yourself a huge favor. If you have, if people have um, chronic health issues, you, you want to spend more time outside. You need stronger signals, and you need you need more help. Um, from the from the light frequencies to kind of support you that way, um, but I guess five minutes is kind of a minimum. And then, if you can take regular light breaks throughout the day, that that would be fantastic because then you you get a stronger circadian signal because you get these these time snippets, so to speak, throughout the day where the, where you have different composition of sunlight, and that will that will help hugely. And Dustin, one last question, because we didn't quite talk about that. And I know that I get this a lot recently when I gave a client a daily routine for taking care of her skin. And then she said, what? No sunscreen. Uh, so what are your thoughts about sunscreen, given that, you know, there is confusion around this? Um, I would love for, to hear this. Do we use? Do we not use? Um, well, the short answer that I would give is like, no, because sunscreen, um, A, if you look at uh, at all the chemicals that they're put in sunscreen, as time goes by, more and more studies come out how toxic they are. That's, that's one element. And then they actually, um, when UV light and other light frequencies hit the sunscreen, it actually degrades. And there was a good study where they showed that there's much more reactive oxygen damage um, with sunscreen than without, because the sunscreen is being broken down by these rays and that causes more damage than just without. The other problem is that um, it only blocks UVB light. Um, and basically, you stop yourself. You you interfere with your you, with your biology in such a way that you cannot. You don't you don't make melanin. You don't thicken your skin, um, because that's blocked. And UVB needs to hit the melanocytes and the keratinocytes and the in the epidermis and the dermis to kind of give you to to build more pigmentation to protect you better to thicken the skin to protect you better to trigger actually DNA repair mechanisms that are inbuilt in us so it's almost like you're making yourself more dependent on a crutch and more susceptible to actual damage 
um, by going down that, that pathway. And in fact, in Ayurveda, Bastian, there is so much that, uh, you know, traditionally in Ayurveda, you would have a bath after Abhyanga, which is oiling the body with sesame oil. And it was said that when you oil the body with sesame oil and then have a shower and you don't use soap, so there's a little bit of the oil left over. And that was the way that it interacted with the sunlight to produce vitamin D in the body. Uh, and it was a way of giving the body a quote-unquote a natural sunscreen and you didn't need anything else. Um, as yeah, always, so Bastian, I mean, I just feel time flies when we speak, but any final words on this? A couple of things. Let's maybe take, if it's okay with you, let's maybe take another couple of minutes or maybe five minutes. Um, so the... If coming back to the sunscreen, right? If um, if people want to use something, um, it's probably best to to use either olive oil or maybe coconut oil. Um, that gives you um, a skin protection factor of two. It's not that much because you go only two, but it's it you know cuts things in half, which is great. And then the the main thing is to to be smart about your exposure. What's what will kill you? Not what will kill you. What will what will um, be a big problem is if you just get an acute dose and then nothing for a few days, and then another big hit, or nothing for a few weeks, and then another big hit. That won't work. You need consistent exposure. You ideally you want exposure every day a little bit. Yeah, and ideally you start in the in the early morning or mid-morning, get five, 10 minutes. Depends obviously on your skin type, right? And it obviously also depends on the intensity of the, of the solar spectrum where you are because in different, like on the equator, you get a, a much higher UV index than you get if you go further, uh, further away from the equator. So if you are a white person who lives close to the equator, you need to be very careful. If you are a black person who lives, let's say, in Canada, you actually cannot get enough light. You cannot get enough UV to satisfy your needs because you have so much pigment that you cannot make sufficient vitamin D even if you run around naked all day or every day. Yeah, so it's, it's important to, to put into context your skin type and your locale and adjust, adjust accordingly. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is because we haven't really touched that much on, on infrared light. And I also want to tie it back to sleep because we all know that melatonin ideally needs to peak throughout or rises when, when the sun sets and then it peaks early in the, or early in the, uh, in the morning, um, or, you know, two or three o'clock and then, um, and then falls again. And then, hopefully is very low throughout the day. It's very interesting that infrared and UV light is responsible, both of them, UV and infrared, for making the melatonin in us. Because there's kind of there's basically two pathways. We have the pineal melatonin, which is which is made indirectly through UV light. When UV light strikes tryptophan, it's converted to serotonin. And then in the absence of light at night, it's released from the pineal gland. That's kind of the circulatory melatonin. The other part of the melatonin is a, is a local melatonin, which is actually made in the mitochondria. And it's made in the mitochondria through infrared light. So again, it's, I find it very interesting that the invisible part of the light spectrum has such a significant impact on one of our kind of key hormones. Yeah, so if we miss out, if we don't spend time outside, if we miss UV, if we miss infrared, your melatonin will be like nowhere near where it ought to be. There's no way. Because you need a lot of infrared light and you need the UV light. So, and without that, you're bound to be, have more reactive oxygen species, have less or worse sleep, have less repair overall and 
basically that leads to disease earlier in life, to put it very simple. And that's exactly what we're seeing, unfortunately. And so, Bastian, I'd like to know from you, because you said we need both. And is there a way that I can set the app so that it reminds me to go out at that particular time so I receive both? Because, you know, it is normal that we get caught up when we are working. And I know that while sure. the intention is there during the day, I know I'm very, I'm, I wake up early and I make sure I do a 90 minute walk in nature and I end as the sun is coming up. So I get a good half an hour when the morning sun is rising. But after that, I don't think I'm conscious of, oh, I need to go out at this time or that time. So is there a way we can set that? And I think that would make things so easy for me if I knew that at this time I need to go out for a little while. Yeah. Well, if you have your morning walk for half an hour, then you probably don't need to worry about UVA rising um, because you're probably getting the start of that if you walk for half an hour. Maybe not, but it, it, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't worry about it. I guess the next key thing is when you, you could set an alarm for when UVB appears in your environment. Um, that would be the next step, which is usually like, I don't know, it, it really entirely depends on the time of year. It could be it might not appear at all, right? If you're in a, in a higher latitude in winter, you, you might not have any UVB. Um, but normally, let's say three hours after, after sunrise. Um, but probably the best bet is to, to set the, uh, the light interval, the light break notification or alarm. So you set an interval, whether that's 90 minutes or two hours or two and a half hours. And then you just go outside for five, 10 minutes, like um, rhythmically. Um, or roundabout there. It doesn't, it obviously, it doesn't matter so much as long as you step outside. Um, and it just in having, you know, in the, in the Western countries, there's that thing of smoko, like a, a, a smoking break. <laughs> um, rather than doing that, just go out and have your light break. Perfect. And, that's and, if, it, and, and if someone someone asks, just go and have us, just, just say, oh, I'm going to have my cigarette. <laughs> And I'm just wondering, Bastian, maybe at some point, if you could come for a half an hour episode and do a tutorial on how to actually use the app as per each person's location, that would really be helpful. Okay, sure, we can do that. Yeah. Um, it's no problem. Lovely conversation, Bastian. Any final words from you? I guess just developing a bit of an awareness around light and uh, wherever people are at, some people might be quite, you know, uh, on track and quite dialed in, um, but just an awareness around the light you are under and how it affects you. Um, because as time goes on and you'll, you'll become a bit more sensitive and attuned to it, you will, you will notice uh, the, the direct impact and whether it's soothing or whether it's kind of a bit more stimulating and kind of stressing. Um, and just yeah, becoming becoming aware of that and develop a bit more of a relationship to the to that beautiful star in the in the sky that um, gives us life every day. And just remind our listeners, Bastian, where can they go to get the app? Well, probably the best way is you can either go directly to the App Store or the Play Store and search for Circadian, your natural rhythm, or you can go to our website circadian.life, L-I-F-E. Great to have you, Bastian. And uh, again, once again, thank you for your time. Pleasure. Thanks, Deepa. Bastian went quite deep into the science of light. If you are someone who is on the lookout for science-backed knowledge of sleep, this is your episode. If it felt overwhelming for you, focus on the top takeaways with the statement Bastian made about simply committing to stepping outside. It is easy to get stuck inside working. I am guilty of it all the time. Use the circadian app to remind you, set your alarms as Bastian shared and use light in the best way possible. I hope you enjoyed this conversation and have a great day. 
This podcast is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subject matter covered in the episodes. The podcast is not acting in the capacity of a doctor or a registered dietitian and is not rendering any professional healthcare or medical service. The information in the podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice or services or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. The advice and tools contained herein may not be suitable for your situation. Any medical questions regarding contraindications and cautions or any questions of whether or not to proceed with any practices provided in the show should be referred to qualified health professionals before adopting the same. The podcast specifically disclaims any responsibility for any liability, loss, risk, personal or otherwise which may be incurred as a direct or indirect consequence of the use of information from this podcast or the application adoption of any of the information provided